Okay, cool. So, hi again, folks. Uh, I think I only have four of you today. Oh, there's another one. Um, there we go. We should get another one joining us. Okay. As people um, arrive, you'll hear like some noises, little chimes, and then I'll admit them and then we'll keep going, okay? But from where we left off the last class, we were still talking about um, 4.2, but we didn't get to finish with 4.2. We just kind of started it. And uh, one of the problems that I wanted to cover, we did do two of the graphs. Um, and there was a third graph here, but I didn't want to cover this graph. I wanted to cover more something that looked like what you would see in the homework, okay? So I selected this problem, which kind of matches one of the variations of the problem in the homework. And I just wanted to talk about the two different ways to do it, okay? So the first way is to treat it just as it is and start trying to find those numbers. So remember for exponentials, we had like some pretty typical numbers, points to use. They were negative one, zero, and one. And so then if you use your calculator to evaluate this expression, it would be three raised to the negative for that guy. And then the X value I'm plugging in is a negative one. So that double negative actually is just gonna do three to the power one, which is three. Then if you plugged in zero, there's no such thing as negative zero. So it's still three to the power zero. Anything to the power zero is always going to be one. If you're not sure, you can always just type it in here, three raised to the negative and plug in zero. It gives you one. And then finally, the last one, three raised to the negative and plug in positive one. And we get one third, okay? So it's kind of the opposite of what you thought, because if you look at this, you're like, oh, well, you have your base three. Shouldn't the negative one give you the reciprocal and the one give you the three exactly? But we got the reverse, okay? And the reason is, is because if I didn't do it directly, I can do it if I manipulate this to look a little bit differently. So notice that in order for me to get negative X as an exponent, I could have had three to the power negative one raised to the X. Because when you have a power raised to a power, you multiply those powers, which would equal a negative X power. But instead of doing that, we kind of broke it apart. And then three to the power negative one means the reciprocal of three, which is one third. And if you're ever not sure, just type in your calculator three to the power negative one, and it tells you that it's one third, okay? okay. Now this looks more like what we saw um, on Thursday, okay? And so if we were to fill in the chart, there's no negative up there anymore. So you know that when you plug in negative one, you're gonna get the reciprocal, which would be three. When you plug in zero, you're gonna get one. And when you plug in one, you're gonna get one third. And so you notice that for both of these charts, we get the same exact coordinates, okay? So regardless of which way you did it, if you just went straight into the calculator or if you manipulated what you had and then used the reciprocal one and then the base idea, you can still get there for both of them, okay? Preferably if I were doing this on my own, I would probably just use negative one, zero and one and put it in the calculator and see what the Y values are. That's just my personal preference. So I'm gonna graph negative one, and positive three, I'm gonna grab zero and one, and then positive one and one third, which is probably about right there. And so then we can see it's going this way and it's going that way. So what is the domain? Because it does ask you that in the web assign. The domain, it does go to the left forever, just little by little, but it does go forever. And it definitely goes to the right forever. So domain would be negative infinity to infinity. The range though, remember these exponentials don't ever cross the x-axis, right? Only if I have a shift up or down, will it do that? But I don't, there's no plus two, minus two, any other number over here. So this is my asymptote. 
and I will never touch it. So the range can only go as low as zero, but it will never reach the Y value zero. But it certainly goes up forever. So it'll go up to positive infinity. And so we do have our domain in a range. I do recommend that if you're doing this problem in your homework, one, that you just make the table negative one, zero, one, and plug in each of those numbers into the X, into the X, and then get the Ys. And then don't worry about doing domain and range until after you have the picture, okay? The domain and range is much easier to look at after you have um, an image. It's harder to look at this and then just automatically know what the domain and range would be, okay? Okay, now that was just to kind of recap the graphing part that we had done in the last class. So in the last class, we defined what an exponential was, right? And then we kind of used it to graph. Now what we're going to get into is equations, okay? And so, I mean, essentially in algebra, that's ultimately the goal, right? Is to be able to solve all kinds of equations. Um, so, excuse me, this gum is getting a little old. I'm going to get rid of it. Um, we are going to now start solving exponential equations. Now, right now, as we move along in chapter four, you'll realize that there's a lot of different techniques to solve exponential and eventually logarithmic um, equations, okay? And depending on the way they look, that will tell you which strategy you apply, okay? However, for right now, because this is the first section with the first batch of equations to solve, right now, the only technique that we can use is this one-to-one -one property that had already been mentioned at the beginning of 4.2, okay? It was like in that big gray chart. And it said that if you had a base and an exponent and a base and a different exponent, the only way this expression can be equivalent to this expression, since they already have the same bases, the only way they can be equal is if they also have the same exponents, right? And so then you're just really worried about the exponent equaling the other exponent. Okay, and then you can solve this equation. The issue though, right now for my first example, is that I don't have the same base, okay? So we really have to start getting like pattern recognition or number recognition to be able to do these kinds of problems right now. Later, I think it's when I go over 4.5, when we eventually get to 4.5, you do not have to do this problem this way. And we will talk about the same kind of problem later and we'll do it a different way, okay? But for right now in this section, this is the way you're gonna have to do it because this is the only information we have so far. So what you wanna do is you wanna write both of these as something with an exponent and whatever that base is, this one has to have the same exact base, okay? Now, me personally, I can look at that and know what the base has to be. Just because I know my um, multiples, like my squares and my cubes and my fourth powers and all of that stuff, okay? So when I look at this, I know that 81 is three to the fourth power. I also know that one third is three to the negative one power, okay? And the fact that I could write them both with the same base three, that is the base that I'm going to have to use, okay? So there's gonna be a few steps I have to do to get it to look like that, okay? So with the fractions, you always wanna write them as whole numbers with a negative exponent. So this first thing you should have thought for if you're doing this problem on your own is, oh my gosh, I have a fraction. I need to write that as three to the negative one exponent, okay? Then that would have been your clue. Uh-oh, I have three as the base. I better have three as the base on the other side, okay? And if you don't know that it's three to the fourth power, just do it in your calculator. So three times three is nine, times a third three is 27, times a fourth three is 81. So three to the fourth power 
should be 81. And so you can kind of figure it out using your calculator, okay? Then I can use my property, right? I mentioned it earlier, actually. When you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you multiply those exponents. So this is the same as saying three to the power negative x equals three to the power four. And according to this one-to-one -one property, the fact that we have the same base now means that those exponents should be equivalent to each other, okay? So this automatically tells us that negative x should equal four. And if I'm trying to solve for just x, then I'm gonna divide by that negative one in front and I get x has to equal negative four. And then you can check, this is the answer, we're done, but you can check. What do you do? You plug in the X value that you found and see if it actually equals 81. So let's try. Parentheses one over three, close it, raise to the negative four, and we hope that it's 81 so that we did it correctly, right? And it is 81. So this does check out, okay? So negative four is the actual answer here. So like pretty sure they give us more <laughs> to practice. So we'll go try another one, okay? Now, example five, it's really tiny in there. So I'm gonna write it a little bit bigger, but it's two to the power X plus four and then eight to the power x minus six okay it's real tiny so i just wanted to make it a little bit bigger okay now for this particular example notice again that the bases are not the same right um and there's no fraction so it wouldn't tell me you know it wouldn't kind of like in disguise tell me what the um what the base should be okay so what I tell people as a hint is if you don't have that fraction business going on, always use the lowest base or a base even lower, okay? So between two and eight, I would have to get them both in terms of the base two with some exponent, okay? But if I had a problem like this, where I had four raised to an exponent and eight raised to an exponent, there's no way to get eight as four with the base. Why? Because four to the first power is four and four to the second power is 16. It jumps right over eight, right? So there's no way to get a power of four to get me eight. So if that's the case, well, guess what though? You can write four as two squared and you can write eight as two cubed. And so then you don't actually use four or eight for the base you end up using two as the base. However, for my example, we got a little bit lucky because we have two and eight and you can write eight. Eight is the same thing as two cubed, right? So you can write eight with a base two. So we don't need to use a lower base. There's actually nothing lower than two. One doesn't, one is silly. One to any power is one. So we'll never have one as the base. But then we use that rule again, right? If you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you must multiply those exponents. Oh, I got someone that got kicked out. Give me one second. I'm just gonna write this three times that. Okay, they should be joining us again. There we go. So I didn't actually multiply it, but I just kind of said those do need to be multiplied together. And then according to that one-to-one -one property, the fact that I have the same base now means that I only need to worry about making the first e um, exponent equal to the second exponent. And then that's just a linear equation, right, that we solve. So we'll distribute our three minus, that is 18. And then we'll start to move over our X's. So depending on which way you like to move things, I if this is a positive, I always go where the bigger positive is. So I move my X's over there. 
I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to cross that out. Um, then the X will cancel and I'll have four. And then three X minus X is two X. And since my X's are on this side, I'm going to move the 18 over there. So then I get 22 equals 2x. And if I'm trying to solve for x, I'm going to divide by 2. So I end up getting 11 equal to x. And remember, we can check our answers. So we're going to do 2 to the 11 plus 4 equal to 8 to the 11 minus 6. And let's see if that's actually correct. I think I can fit the calculator in there. Yeah. So two raised to the power 11 plus four. And it says it's this weird number, three, two, seven, six, eight. Now let's do eight to the power 11 minus six. And we get the exact same number, right? We get three, two, seven, six, eight on both sides. So yes, it does check out, okay? So if you can make the big one match that base, then go for it. But if you can't, like in this case, I can't get eight. Four to the one power is four, four to the second power is 16. It jumps right over eight. So if you can't get it in the eight into a power of a base of four, then go even smaller than four and eight. Go down to two, okay? But these should be multiples of whatever the smaller base is. So I wouldn't use a base of three, right? Because four and eight, they don't have factors of three. But they do have factors of two. So that's why I went down to the base two. Now, another kind of equation that we can solve is, um, I don't even know why this equation is in here, but it is. So we're going to do it, but it really has nothing to do with exponentials. This is not an exponential expression, okay? This is um, an algebraic expression. It's x to some power, not a number with the power that has x in it, okay? So I really don't know what the purpose of this problem is in here, but in case there's one on the homework, we're going to talk about it, okay? So let me write it a little bit bigger. That is a four thirds power. And in order for you to get rid of a fraction exponent, you basically apply another exponent, but the reciprocal of it, right? So kind of like when you wanted to get rid of a square, you took the radical, right? But remember a radical is a one half exponent. So you literally were taking whatever two is and then applying a reciprocal exponent, okay? And so that's the same thing I'm going to do here. I'm going to take this left side and reciprocate the exponent. And whatever I do to this side, I have to do the same to the other side. Now over here, 4 thirds times 3 fourths is just 1, but you don't have to write a 1 exponent. And over here, I don't know what that is. I mean, I do know what it is. It's 27, but if you don't know what it is, then you do it in the calculator, right? So we do 81 raised to the three fraction four. So it should look just like it does on the paper, right? And we get 27. If you're wondering how I did that in my head, it's literally the fourth root of 81 cubed. And remember I told you earlier that 81 is three to the power four. So the fourth root of three to the power four is three, and then three cubed is 27. So that's how I did it in my head. You're not expected to do that in your head. You can just use the calculator, okay? And then if you wanted to check it, you would check it, right? Is 27 raised to the four thirds equal to 81? So 27 raised to the four thirds, press enter and see if that's 81. And it is. So 27 is our answer. Okay. Again, I don't know why that problem is in this section. It really does not have a purpose here, but it's in there. I guess they're just trying to remind you. I, I have no idea why that's in there. But if it's in the homework, <laughs> at least you have an example. Okay. 
Um, we did talk about it, but that was back in like 1.6, a long, 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 long time ago. Okay, so remember I gave you my car story, right? Where we talked about um, where I was trying to buy a car and I knew about compound interest, right? And so I caught them and I saved myself a few thousand dollars. Um, now we're going to start talking about those formulas, okay? So the first formula that they give me is for just a regular compounding interest equation, okay? So I'm going to tell you what all these letters represent, and then I'm going to give you some advice on the one of the numbers, okay? Now, we have to remember that pi is 3.14. Eventually, we're going to talk about another number called E, and it's about this number here. But we have like a whole lesson on it, so we'll see that number come up again, okay? Um, so P, and it's very important that we know what each of these letters mean. P is the amount that is deposited into your account, earning interest, or P could be the amount of the loan that you get, right? So if you take out a loan, you're getting a loan for a certain dollar amount, okay? So it's either what you deposit or it could be what you borrow. It just depends on the situation, right? Do you have the money or do you not have the money? That's that's the difference with P. But P can be represented, is represented by what you borrow for a loan or what you deposited for an investment, okay? And regardless of which one it is, because remember, your loan is somebody else's investment, right? So even if you're talking about what you're borrowing, you're still talking about somebody else's um, investment here. So we're gonna say that this investment is paying an annual rate of interest R. So R is always going to be your interest rate, okay? And R is usually given as a percent, but when you use it, you have to use the decimal. And it's important that you know that because if you don't change the percents to a decimal, your answers will be all off. So if I tell you that the interest rate is 5%, you don't plug in five for R. You plug in 0 0.05 for R, right? That's the decimal representation of 5%. So, and I think your calculator does it for you. I just wanna make sure. Yes, it does. So if I tell you the interest rate is 5%, you just hit five and then right above the parentheses in green is a percent. So second and open parentheses. And if you hit enter, it tells you the decimal representation of it. Okay, so that's nice. Especially when the, the, the percentages get weird, okay? Um, and then there's also a button that says convert to percent. So let's say you're doing a problem and you solve for R and you get that R is 0 0.0125, okay? You can hit second and then the close parentheses and it'll actually convert it to a percent. And so that's actually 1.25%. So your calculator can go in both directions. It could take your percent and give you the decimal or it could take your decimal and give you the percent. So this one goes from percent to decimal. This one goes from decimal to percent, right? The little arrow tells me I'm going to percent. And that's very, that'll come in handy. I mean, in essence, it's just a matter of moving decimals around, but if you get confused of which way to move it, then you have your calculator as a backup, okay? Now in is the number of times that this money is compounded. Okay, so remember I told you that credit cards usually go by a monthly compounding. So normally at the end of the month, they figure out how much interest you uh, are gonna owe, and then they tag that onto the balance. And if you don't pay anything, the next month that total balance becomes the new P value. And so then the interest is collected on all of that. Even your interest is collecting interest, okay? So that's what compounded means. It means your interest is collecting interest, which is great for investors, right? Your money is making its own money. You're not even doing anything. But for people who are borrowing the money, especially with credit cards, it's not great because that just means 
you're owing more money on top of money, right? It's not good. So T is the number of years that the account is going for, right? How long you left the investment in there or how long it's taking you to pay back your whole loan, okay? But T is the number of years. And then A is the amount of dollars that will happen after everything is said and done. So A is like the total amount, okay? So I take some money, I either invest it or I borrow it. There's an interest rate that comes along with that. It will get compounded a certain number of times per year. And I will have um, either had that investment for so many years or it will take me so many years to pay off this loan, okay? And that's T. So those are all the different values. Now in, changes depending on the scenario okay so if it says that it's going to compound your interest annually well then that's only one time per year so your in is one if it says it's going to compound your interest semi-annually that means twice per year so in is two if it says quarterly that means in is four because there's four quarters in a year if it says monthly, in is 12, because there's 12 months in a year. If it says weekly, in is 52, because there's 52 weeks in a year. And daily is the one that's up for debate. Depending on what book you use, some of them use 360, some of the books use 364, and some of the books use 365. So it just depends on who the author is. 360 will give you a pretty good estimate, 364 and 365 give you even better estimates, okay? Um, one of these is not better than the other, although both of these are better than 360, okay? Um, for our book, because you have to do the homework that's connected to our book, right? You want to make sure that you're using the right number so that you can get your answers correct, right? So our book uses 364 for daily. Okay, so make sure that when, if it does have a problem that says it was compounded daily, make sure you're putting 364 for in. Okay, if you try to do the other two, it will be wrong. But I know that sometimes people look at YouTube videos or they look at outside resources, they ask their friends. Their friends may be taking the class at a different college using a different book, and then therefore they use a different number. Okay, that's why I felt it was important to mention this. Okay, YouTube video is the same. It all just depends on what book they were using and where they got their values from. Okay, so we're gonna take that formula and you will be provided the formula. You will not be provided all of this information. So you'll either have to memorize it or kind of learn what it represents and then you could figure it out based on the problem, okay? Um, but we definitely want to practice some problems. So I'm going to rewrite my formula here. And that's the number one. That is not um, another letter. Okay, that's the number one. Why? Because when you pay something back, don't you pay back what you borrowed plus the interest, right? So that's kind of what this is representing. It's representing the amount that you owe that you borrowed and you have to pay the interest as well. And that's what A stands for. A is the total, total amount. So if I'm investing it, then it's what I put in there plus all the interest that I earned. If I'm borrowing it, I have to pay back what I borrow plus all the interest, okay? So that's what that one in there represents. So for example, seven, it says $1,000 is deposited. So right there, I know right away this is P because it was the money that I put into the account, not the amount of money that came out after everything was said and done. That would be A, okay? So both of these are dollar amounts. The other letters are not dollar amounts, right? T is time, R is a percent, and N is just a number. It just tells me how many times per year. So the next part of my sentence says, suppose a thousand is deposited in an account paying 4% interest. So that right there is a percent. I know it's my R, okay? And I know that R should not be in a percentage. It would always be given to me in a percentage, but it should be as a decimal. 
So 0 0.04, okay? And it's compounded quarterly. It even tells me a hint there, right? But that means that n would equal four. n is the number of times that it's compounded. And so that we don't make anything more complicated, the first question says, find the amount in the account after 10 years with no withdrawals. And there's a reason why they say with no withdrawals, because if you were withdrawing money, it makes the situation way more complicated, okay? And every now and then you have smart, not that there's not smart people, but every now and then there's smart Alex more than smart, <laughs> but they'll be like, but miss, what if I took out money? Then it wouldn't be what's in the account. So that's why they mentioned um, that about no withdrawals, okay? Because we get people who are like, try to see things in different perspectives and we just kind of want to narrow your focus, okay? But it did tell me 10 years. And I know that the only letter that's in, in uh, time is T. And T is in years, so that means that T is going to be 10. So I have all the numbers I need to plug in in order to find the amount in the account, because the amount in the account is A, and that's what they want me to find out. So we're gonna write A equals, and instead of P, we're gonna write the 1000 for P. Here's the number one. For rate, we're gonna use the decimal version. For N, we're using four. For time, we're using 10. And it makes me use in again, so I'm going to use four again. So twice we had to use that. And since it's money, whenever we type this in there, you're always going to round to two decimal places unless the directions specifically say like round to the nearest dollar or something. If they don't give you any information on rounding, because it's money, we always round to the uh, nearest cent. So two decimal places, right? So you can type this all in here just like that. 1,000 parentheses, one plus fraction 0 0.04, downstairs, a four, go to the right, close it, raise my exponent, 10 parentheses, four. Now I know you can't see the whole thing on your calculator, but it should look exactly like it does on your paper. Um, and then if you hit enter, remember this is money. So this third decimal place does not change the six cents. It stays like that. So it's 1488.86 cents. Okay. So, and then the part B says how much interest was earned over that 10 year period? Well, I put $1,000 in the account, right? And now, 10 years later, this is the amount that's in the account. So how much interest was earned? Interest will always be the amount afterward minus what you put in, right? That difference tells you how much interest you collected, okay? So for ours, it would be 1488.86 minus P, which was 1,000. So our interest was essentially $488 and 86 cents. And this is the whole reason why I, when I graduated high school, I was given a $100, um, I don't even know what it's called, like a savings bond or something like that. And those things had like a two or 3% interest rate. <laughs> and everybody's like, how come you don't cash it out? It's been already however many years, right? And I'm like, cause it's probably gained like a hundred dollars. It probably doubled by now and that's about it. Um, so <laughs> just let it sit there forever and then we'll see what happens. Um, but that's not a lot. I mean, it's a lot of interest, but not really a lot of interest, right? You almost got half of what you deposited in there, but it took 10 years for that to happen. Okay. I mean, if it were a bigger amount of money in investment, then yeah, the turnout would be way better, right? So the more money that you put in there, of course, the more interest gets collected. And so the better off you are. That's why they talk about general generational wealth being such a thing, right? It because the amount you start with totally impacts everything. Um, okay, 
So let's see, because the, these word problems, they, they look like they're all the same, but they're slightly different. So we're definitely going to have to analyze the next batch. OK. So for example, eight, it says um, Becky must pay a lump sum of six thousand dollars in five years. So. OK, she has to pay the six thousand dollars in five years. So five years is nice. That tells me that T, right, equals five. But if this is how much I have to pay, okay, that's really the amount afterward, not the amount that you would deposit or that you would borrow or whatever. Okay, so it's not going to be your starting amount. It's going to be the amount afterward, okay? So of course it says what amount deposited today at 3.1% compounded annually will grow to 6,000 in five years. So this 6,000 is not the amount deposited, which means it's not the P value. This is the A value, okay? We know that that one is the T. We know that for this one, it's R, but we have to use the decimal version. So we get 0 0.031. And we need N compounded annually right there. So that's only one time per year. But I don't know P. So it says what amount deposited. That's P, but I don't know what it is. Okay. So we're gonna take our formula, let me scroll up to the top, and we're gonna plug in all the numbers we have, but we don't have P. So P will stay the letter P, okay? So for A, we have 6,000. P, we do not know, so it stays a P. R, we know is 0 0.031. N is one, time is five, and N gets used again, but it's still one. So you cannot put the whole right side of this stuff in your calculator, but you can put all of this in your calculator, okay? So that you can see what decimal number is actually getting multiplied by P. So let's try to put that all in here. Parentheses, one plus, fraction 0 0.031 over one, close it, raise it to five parentheses one. And it looks exactly like it does on the paper. So I'm gonna hit enter and I get this decimal. I don't have to write all of these digits down. It does keep going. It's just my calculator has no more space to write all the decimals but I'm gonna leave that in my calculator because I'm gonna use it in a little bit. So if we're trying to find P and P is getting multiplied by this weird number, the only way for me to get P by itself is to do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. So we wanna divide both sides by 1.16, blah, blah, blah. So here that number will cancel, right? And you'll just get P by itself. But over here, I'm going to type in 6,000 divided by that number right there. So you can either write second and then the negative, which pulls up the last answer, or you can just highlight that number and hit enter, and it copies it in there, OK? And then we get, remember, it's money. So 5150.60, since this one will not change that 0. So apparently this is how much money you would have to put in the account now so that after the five years, you would have 6,000 in the account that you can pay off because apparently she, Becky needs to pay something off um, $6,000 in five years. Now let's see what it says here. It says for part B, if only 5,000 is available to deposit now, what annual interest rate is necessary for the 
22 increase to 6,000 in five years. So we're gonna do the same thing, except we're not going to plug in R because that's what we're trying to figure out. And we're not going to plug in, um, I know that's it, that's the only unknown here. So it's saying we're gonna deposit 5,000. At the end, we still want 6,000. The time is still five years. They haven't told me that the way it's compounding is gonna change. So N is still gonna equal one, but we don't know what R is, okay? So I'm gonna go back to my formula. A is gonna be 6,000. P is gonna be 5,000. The number one, R is gonna stay R. N is one and T is five and N is one. So we have 6,000, 5,000, one, R over one is just R and five times one is just five. So this is the equation that we have to solve. And I wanna get R by itself. So I have to kind of peel away the layers. The first thing you wanna get rid of is this 5,000 that's multiplied. Then once this is by itself, the next thing you need to get rid of is that power. Once that's gone, then you can move over the one, okay? And that's how we'll get R completely by itself. So let's do the first step, which is to divide by 5,000. I think I put too many zeros. And I think that's 1.2, but let me make sure because my brain does weird stuff sometimes. Yes, 1.2. These would cancel. So I just have this. And then we talked about how to get rid of those, right? In order to get rid of powers, you apply the reciprocal power. So I would apply, instead of five, it'd be one over five. And whatever I do over there, I have to do the same over here. So that will undo the exponent. It'll give me an exponent of one. But if I have an exponent of one, I don't even need the parentheses anymore. But 1.2 raised to the one fifth, I don't know what that is. It's this word decimal. And it does keep going. My calculator just chops it off at some point. And then if I minus one, I'm gonna get 0 0.03713728 dot dot dot. Okay. Now, normally it tells you what to round your decimal to, your rate, but rate is always in a percent. I don't have it in percent yet. So let me take that number and let me do the minus one to it so I can get this decimal. And then I'm gonna convert it to a percent. So second and the closed parentheses. And it will take that decimal and convert it to a percent. And I get R equals 3.5. Seven one three seven two eight blah blah blah. Um, see, I told you there was more numbers after the nine. It just doesn't show them. See how they even have two more digits, three four. Normally, they tell you what to round your rate to. I have no idea why this one did not tell me, but it should. And normally, it's like to the nearest tenth of a percent. So this spot. So that means R needed to be about 3.7%. That makes sense. Here it was 3.1% and you almost just needed to uh, put in 5,000, right? It was pretty close to that 5,000. But if you raise the interest rate just a little bit more, then you can start with the 5,000 and still end up with the 6,000. So the interest rate just needed to go up a little bit to make enough money to just deposit 5,000. So we've actually solved like all the different cases that we can possibly solve for right now. We took that equation, right? And in the first one, we were given all these values and all we had to do was figure out A. For the second example, um, example eight, 
we plugged in all the numbers and we had to figure out P. And for the second part of the second example, we plugged in all the numbers and we had to find R. The only other prop, uh, variable that they'll ever ask you for is T, okay? They'll tell you all the information. They'll say, hey, it's compounded this many times per year. It has this rate. I'm gonna start with this and I wanna end with that, but how long is it gonna take me, okay? Those are problems that want you to solve for T. Unfortunately, right now, we cannot solve for T. We don't have a way yet. But as soon as we get to 4.3 and we learn about logarithms, we will be able to solve for T, okay? So these interest problems, you'll see them in 4.3, but they will come back again in 4.4, okay? Because with the knowledge you learn in 4.4, you'll be able to find T as well. Okay, so here's now where we get to talk about that number E. Remember I mentioned that we're going to eventually talk about this number E. I know when you took geometry, they talked about pi, right? 3.14, because it happens in circles and things like that. Um, but there's another number that pops up in compounding interest. Because all these problems have been compounding interest a certain number of times per year. However, there are cases where you're compounding what is called continuously. So it's not even every second. It's not even every millisecond. It is literally continuously. Like there is no amount of time that is short enough to consider for it to be equivalent to continuously, okay? And you can use short amount of times that will get you close to continuously, but it'll never actually get to the continuous situation. In order to get to that situation, we have to talk about E, okay? So we're gonna do this little exercise here that's gonna help us figure it out, okay? So it says, suppose that $1 is invested, which means your P is one, $1, at 100% interest, which means your R is one, right? If you put 100%, it tells you it's one. So that's the R. It doesn't tell you the number of times it's compounded because remember we said, we're trying to get as close to continuously as possible, um, then your interest rate is 1.00, and the interest rate per period is one over N, which is this thing represented here, right? R over N. And according to the formula with P equal to one, the compound amount after the end of one year, so now T is one. So here you had A equals P e parentheses, one plus R in to the TM. And you're telling me that P is $1, R is 100%, which is one, and T is one year. Well, what is that? You don't have to write the one in the front. You have one plus one over N, and what's one times N? It's just N, okay? So this is the formula to figure it out. So then they start using numbers here, right? They start using one, two, five, ten, one thousand. 1,000. What happens if I keep compounding it this many times, okay? A million times, right? That sounds like pretty close to those milliseconds. Probably not exactly, but it sounds like it's pretty close. So let's plug these numbers in here. I'm gonna do, let me do one stores X, parentheses one plus, you'll never have to do this. It's just the exercise to figure out what E is, okay? And then raised to the power X. So I just replaced my N with X. And since I already stored one N as N, <laughs> we get the value two. Now I'm gonna store two and go plug it into that expression. And I get, let me get the decimal for that, 2.25. 
Now we're going to do five stores X. And we get 2.48832. Then we're going to do 10. I'm just going to fill out the rest of this um, box. 2.59374210. Here we go, getting into a hundred now. We're getting closer to what I know E is. Two more, 10, one, two, three. So now we're plugging in 10,000. And then finally, one million. And we get 2.718. Two eight zero four six nine blah blah blah. Okay, now you could keep going. You could type in one billion, one trillion, and keep going. All that's going to happen is that these decimals will still always be the same, but these decimals will get closer and closer to the actual value of e. Okay, now e is one of those irrational numbers where the decimal value goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Okay. Um. So normally when we use it, we normally use 2.718. So normally we chop it off just right here. So if we ever, just like pi, we use 3.14. We don't usually use 2.72. We usually go that third um, decimal, okay? But your calculator has an E button, okay? And it's right here. It's right there. You have second button, log button, and then this is an L in, and we're going to learn about these two buttons in the next section, okay? But right above the L in button, you see E with the power, okay? And if I press E, and I just give it a one power, because I want to know what E by itself is, I hit enter, and it's 2.18281, and it doesn't keep staying 128, because after this 28, it starts using other decimals, okay? Um, so I know that it looks like it's a repeating decimal, but it's not. It just looks like that, those first few decimals, and then after that, it just starts going crazy. Okay, so that was just for us to kind of see where this E is coming from. And why do we do that? Because that's what happens when the number of times compounded gets absurdly large. And that's exactly what's happening when you're talking about a case where this money is continuously adding interest on, okay? And it might sound scary, like, oh my gosh, it's adding it on every little, even smaller than a millisecond. I'm gonna owe gobs and gobs and gobs of money. <laughs> it turns out that it doesn't even affect it like that much. I mean, it does affect it, but not ridiculously amounted. Um, so we'll see some problems, maybe, maybe today. Um, we'll see some problems where you can kind of see the comparison between the continuous and then maybe like compounded quarterly or something. And the dollar amount's not that far off, okay? Um, so here we have another formula, but this formula is only used when it says it's continuous compounding, okay? So if it starts telling you in those word problems that it's compounded so many times a year or it's compounded quarterly or it's compounded you know, monthly, things like that. It's not this formula. The only time you use this formula is if it says compounded continuously. When you see this phrase right there, that's when you use that formula, okay? And it's P, E to the R, T. So there's no N in this one, okay? The E replaced all of those Ns. So let's see our first example. And all the other letters still represent the same thing, right? R is still your percent rate. 
you have to put it in decimal form. T is still the years. A is still the amount afterward. And P is still your investment or your loan amount. Okay. Now, example nine says, suppose that 5,000 is deposited. So right there, I know that that's P. In an account paying 3% interest, so I know that R is 0 0.03. Here's those fancy words, compounded continuously, which tells me to use this formula. For five years, which tells me T equals five, and it says find the total amount, total amount is A, on deposit at the end of the five years. So how much is in there after the end of the five years? So we're gonna take the P and plug it in, take the R and plug it in, and take the T and plug it in. Okay, R and T have to get multiplied. So I used parentheses to make sure that I multiply those. I will put that in the calculator. So clear 5,000. Remember that button, it's right there, right here. So I have to hit second and then this button. We get the little E and I can type in my decimal times five. And I get 5809. This is money. The one is not going to change the seven. And so that's how much um, will be in the account after some time. So notice that um, it basically made it go up. In five years, it made it go up $800. Okay, so this one is a good exercise just so that you can see the comparison between all the different in values and and then how much continuously affects situation, okay? So this one's just more of like an observation problem. I think you do have some problems like one or two in your homework that ask you to do kind of the same thing, okay? They might not use $1 and $1,000. They might use different numbers, but same thing. So it says, we found that $1,000 invested at 4% compounded quarterly for 10 years grew to this amount. Compare this same investment compounded annually, semi-annually, monthly, daily, and continuously. So remember, for annually, N is 1. Semi-annually, N is 2. Quarterly, it's 4. Monthly, it's 12. And for daily, your book tells you 364. And for continuously, we don't use N, we use the E4 formula. Okay. So they want you to do it on a thousand a dollar and a thousand dollars. I don't know why they make you do it on a thousand, on one dollar, but whatever. So we know R is equal to 4%, which is 0 0.04. We know that this is going to be your p-value for both of them. Um, and we know that t is going to be 10 years. Okay. So remember the formula we're using. So I'm going to start plugging in all of these numbers. So for this one, I get A equals $1, and then 1 plus 0 0.04 over 1 raised to the 10 times 1. And we'll see what we get. For this one, we're going to do the same formula, but we're plugging in 1,000 for P. N is still 1. So let's see what we get. I'd rather do the thousand first, and then when I have to do this one, I'll just erase the zeros. Okay. So let me clear that out. One thousand, one plus fraction zero point zero four over one raised to the ten times one. 
and I get 1480.24. Now I'm going to do the same formula, but I'm going to go to the front and I'm going to erase those three zeros. And I get 1.48. It's money, so the zero is not going to change the eight. Now we're gonna do the same thing for all the other ones. So just bear with me. I'm gonna to try to write this in there. I just wanna finish this problem and then we'll stop for the day, okay? So I'm just gonna set up the other formulas. So it's still $1. All of these is gonna be $1 first. Even this one that has a totally different formula, A is still $1. It's just gonna be E to the R, times t, a different formula, okay? But all these other ones have the same formula for n. But here I'm gonna divide by two and then do 10 times two. Here I'm gonna divide by four and then do 10 times four. There I'll divide by 12 and then do 10 times 12, then three, six, four, and 10 times three, six, four. And then for the other side, I'm gonna do the same thing, but instead of a dollar for P, I'm gonna use a thousand for P. So it's literally all the same formulas, but instead of this one in front of the parentheses, it's a thousand in front of the parentheses. So just bear with me because then I can go on my calculator and just um, use the programming capability from here once I have them all. And then the same thing, but it's a different formula, right? So P is a thousand and then E to the R T. So let's go ahead. Now, notice the only thing that changes for all of these is the N, right? So I'm gonna plug in these same numbers and I'm gonna make the where the twos are the variable in my calculator. So I'm gonna say two store is X one parentheses, one plus 0 0.04 over, and instead of two, I'm gonna put X parentheses, and then 10 times X. Oops, nope, I didn't hit my power button. Raise to the 10 times X. So when I put in two for X, it's gonna plug in a two there. And now I have 49 cents because of the five after the eight. Now I'm gonna do four stores X. And I get 1.49 again. It's just an eight that changes that eight. Now we're gonna plug in 12. And I get 1.49 again. And then three, six, four. And I get 1.49 again. So we'll do this one later so you can see the comparison. Okay. Now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to change my one in my formula to um, let me do two stores X again because I'm starting off here. But when I go to my formula, I need a thousand to go there. So now it says a thousand and then all of that. I get 1485.95. Then we'll keep going. Sorry, just bear with me for a little bit. 
we're almost there. So we can see how much it actually affects things if you do it continuously. So notice that even with the thousand dollars, it's not growing too much. I mean, from one uh, compounded once a year versus compounded every single day of the year, it really only made an eleven dollar difference, right? Now let's see what we get when we use this formula: one, and then e to the zero point zero four times ten. I get one point four nine again. Now, if I do a thousand e to zero point zero four times ten, we get one four nine one point eight two. So look at that. If I do it every single day versus every single millisecond, it only makes a difference of about three cents. Okay. So I know it sounds crazy when people say that it's continuously compounding. You're like, oh my gosh, it's just adding interest like every single millisecond. But the interest amounts are so little that after all of that time, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Okay. You definitely don't want a loan that has <laughs> um, compounded continuously, but it's not going to affect the amount of the loan like ridiculously amounted. Okay. Um, so we're going to stop here. This section is a very, very, very large section. Actually, we don't need to stop. This is the end of the section. Um, when we come back, we're going to do 4.3. Um, see, this is the last page, and we don't do the word problems. At least not yet. There's a whole section. It's 4.6. It's all word problems. So we'll do a bunch of word problems when we get to that point, but none in this section other than these, um, oh, what are they called? These interest rate problems, okay? So in the next class, we'll talk about logarithms, okay? And there's a lot of information in this packet. So hopefully we get to talk about all of it. Um, and then if we have time, we'll go into 4.4. And 4.4 is really short. Like it's really short. It's one rule. And then it's just like a couple of examples on applying that one rule. So 4.4 is usually very, very short. So regardless, if we don't get to it, um, we could eventually cover it next week because it'll be really, really short and then continue with 4.5, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions for me? So this is kind of what I'm looking at. I think I might've shown you guys this for the last class, but it's worth talking about again. Um, so we finished 4.2. We'll do 4.3 the next class. If we get to start 4.4, great. If not, we could do it the next day because it's so small. And then just really concentrate on 4.5. And then that Thursday, we'll be able to work on the review. And then the following week is just the week of um, Thanksgiving. So we would only have one class period. And if we need it to review some more, that's fine. But what I really want you guys to do is take that test before Thanksgiving, just so you can get it off of your plate. And then you can just enjoy your Thanksgiving. Um, and then when we come back from the Thanksgiving break, we're just going to concentrate on reviewing for the final exam. Okay. Um, and the final exam is comprehensive. So we will need both of those days to kind of jog back our memory from all the stuff way at the beginning. Okay. Yes. Robin, did you have a question? Oh yeah. When is our final exam? Like, um, I don't know exactly. Let me go check real quick. Um, let me exit out of here. I'm on little computer. That is a good question. And I was going to look it up and I forgot to go look it up. I think I put it in your syllabus. But I don't remember. I made this thing like, it was like years ago. Um. Okay, there it is at the bottom. So yours is on Thursday. And I'm going to make it available on the computer, right? We don't need to sit in class time. <laughs> so as long as you do it by the end of that Thursday, then you're good. 
Is there also like a time limit on that? Um, there is. Like, there's always a time limit. It should be, I think, like two hours. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And I think there's like 20, 24 or 25 questions on it, but it's all multiple choice. And on those, um, I only look at your work if you get it marked wrong. So I don't look at your work like I do on your tests. I feel like I torture everybody throughout the whole year. <laughs> By the time you get to the final exam, I'm like, if you selected the right one, we're good. <laughs> so I only look at your paperwork if it counted something wrong. And then I try to add points if you did something that was in kind of the general direction of correctness. But good questions. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, well, we finished like maybe three minutes early. <laughs> Not much, but, <laughs> but you guys can enjoy the rest of your day. And if you do come up with questions later, just make sure to text me and remind. Okay, but have a good one. I'm sorry, I was checking to see if the 4.2 was open. Um, For the homework? My computer is going slow. I believe I might have pushed all of them open. So it might say that the due date has already passed, but if uh -huh. you click, it should still be clickable. Okay. And you still should be able to see how like it says past due, but I could click it and do it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Sure, sure. And have a good day. You too.